Obviously, really important topic today uh, and really important author uh, with us today, um, Hisham Aidi. Uh, he's here to give a talk on the topic, uh, The Cultural War on Terror, Race, Art, and American Public Diplomacy, which builds off of his fantastic new book, Rebel Music, Race, Empire, and the New Muslim Youth Culture, which I have a copy of here and, by the way, is available for purchase at a discounted rate if you're interested. Um, it's a fantastic book. Uh, rave reviews uh, in such uh, little known places like the New York Times and the Washington Post um, using adjectives like brilliant, uh, groundbreaking, tour de force. I mean, pretty incredible um, uh, entry into the field uh, by Hisham in this book on this particular topic. I'm not going to say too much up front. Uh, I know Hisham has a lot of ground to cover. We want to have plenty of time for Q&A. I think people that are here today are, are obviously interested in the topic and probably have some thoughts and want to have some discussion on some pretty hot topics. But let me just say, you know, every once in a while, something gets written that not only perfectly captures a snapshot of major events and trends going on around the world, but that also gets proven more and more prescient as time goes by. Uh, sort of the I think the, the, uh, the marquee example of that, in my opinion, is something like George Kennan's long telegram from Moscow uh, in early 1946 that laid out the new assessment of Soviet global intentions and that only grew in importance as the months and years went by. Uh, that would be one example of, of a piece of written work that had big importance at the time it was read and also increased in power and leverage uh, over time. Now, I'm not saying Hisham is George Kennan. I don't think he would compare himself to George Kennan for a whole variety of reasons. Um, but I am saying that Hisham has exposed a path-breaking approach to understanding vital movements and trends going on in the world today. Uh, we're talking Muslim youth culture, global social and political movements, technology, social media, and how they all play into some of the most critical global issues of the day. Uh, one quick example I'll offer, uh, you know, just six or eight months ago, I imagine few people in this room ever heard of the term jihadi cool. Uh, because few people had probably heard of the term ISIS six or eight months ago, uh, which has made outreach to Muslim youth in the Arab and Muslim world and in the West and elsewhere in the world a core part of their global strategy, uh, much more so than core al-Qaeda group and the other al-Qaeda affiliates from the 1990s, the 2000s, and into the 2010s. ISIS, with a very highly sophisticated PR wing, has made a concerted effort to appeal to young Muslims all around the world using the images of youth and culture like rap music, video games, action figures, clothing styles, all trying to brand their movement as cool, promising new recruits fun and adventure if they join or support the movement. Uh, and they have been having probably more success than we'd be comfortable with. Uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of young Muslims have sought to join ISIS from Africa, Asia, Europe, North America, uh, including three Muslim American girls from Den the Denver area just a few weeks ago that were, inter they were intercepted in Germany uh, on their way to Syria. Uh, in other words, culture, and particularly youth culture, is playing an increasingly important role in the spread of radical Islamist movements, and as such, those same tenets will need to be a part of solutions to the problem. And this is where Hisham steps in. Uh, and I agree with the term brilliant. Uh, it's a br he has a brilliant assessment of the complexity of Muslim youth culture. And despite the radical nature of some of the subject matter, we're talking rap and hip hop and things like that that are by definition uh, radical in their, in their themology, um, he actually offers a calming narrative that shows that while youth in general and Muslim youth in particular may often be attracted to countercultural movements that you know fight the power, uh, that does not mean that these movements accept or support radical violence that's often done in their name in, in some of these cases. Uh, quite the contrary, youth culture can actually play a very key role in pushing back on radical violent movements. And to see how much this is relevant today in the policy world, consider that in 2005, the US State Department under the Bush administration set up an office specifically designated to send so-called hip hop envoys to Africa, Asia, and the Middle East in an effort to show the Muslim world that American Muslims enjoy free expression and to use music specifically as a means to pose an alternative unifying message against the narrative of the violent jihadist movements. So these are some topics I just wanted to raise. Hisham's going to get much more deeply into all of these things. 
Um, I, he's going to get into some of the successes, the failures, some of the, the misdirections, obviously thinking about what's the direction that the future should hold on some of these topics. Uh, most of you know Hisham, but just to uh, remind you, he's a lecturer here uh, in, at SIPA. Uh, he did his PhD here in the political science department, uh, and before he started teaching, he was a cultural reporter in Harlem in the Bronx, uh, working on these very same issues, which I imagine was the genesis of, of the book from, from back, uh, you know, uh, over a decade ago, and you see how uh, how, how in-depth and how long-term this project has been taking up a big chunk of Hisham's life, and I think it's paid off uh, in a big way. So let me just welcome Hisham, and we'll have some discussion after. Thank you all for coming. Um, enjoy your lunch. I'm going to speak for about 45 minutes. Um, I'm not really going to talk about uh, terrorism or ISIS. I'm going to talk more about jazz, hip-hop, and uh, American cultural diplomacy. Uh, music and American Cultural Diplomacy, but I'll touch on these issues. So I'll give you a brief overview of the book, um, and then I'll talk specifically on, on the chapter. Uh, I'll read from one chapter that has to do with American uh, public diplomacy towards Europe, uh, towards Muslim communities in Europe. So the genesis of the book. Um, this book grows out of a disagreement that I had with uh, the French scholar, uh, Olivier Roy. Some of you may know him. He's known in the U.S. as Oliver Roy. Uh, he's a scholar of, uh, of, of global Islam. And in 2002, when I was still a graduate student, Olivier wrote an article in the National Interest arguing that with the end of the Cold War, the only radical protest movement left standing, left available for, for Western youth was global Islam. He was trying to understand why young men were going abroad to fight, why right? people such as Jose Padilla and Hernan, uh, what's his name, uh, Hiram Torres had gone to Afghanistan. He's trying to understand why you have these young men uh, and young women, not necessarily of Muslim background, going overseas to fight. And the argument that he said, he said that 20 years ago, such individuals would have joined radical leftist movements, which have now disappeared with the end of the Cold War. Now there are only two international movements of radical protest, the anti-global, anti-globalization movement, and radical Islamists. To convert to Islam today, he said, is a way for a European rebel to find a cause that has little to do with theology, unquote. Right. In other words, the popularity of Islam among youth has to do with the collapse of the left, the collapse of the global left after 1990. One hears this, uh, this argument often in Europe, uh, the claim that it is the decline, that one of the reasons for the appeal and the growth of Islamist groups in the European urban periphery is because of the decline of socialist and uh, communist parties. And by implication, uh, the argument, people such as Roy make this argument, uh, one way to address youth alienation is by reinvigorating socialist parties, right? That's one way to siphon off uh, youth discontent, right? Uh, so I wrote a response, uh, a piece in response to, uh, to Olivier saying that's actually not quite true. It's not, it's not simply all about class, it's not simply all about class and economic alienation and the decline of the left. It's also about race. And when you talk about Islam in the West, you need to talk about race, right? Um, this idea of Islam as a post-Cold War alternative uh, ignores a century-old interaction between Islam and the New World and the black freedom struggles of the New World. Islamic history and theology have had an appeal long before 1990, long before the end of the Cold War. Uh, some would say, you know, you know, a century ago, starting in the, in the 1900s, some would say even earlier. Roy would go on to write a well-regarded book called Globalized Islam, 2004. He responds to me indirectly saying, yes, racial minorities in the U.S. have been known to embrace Islam and so on, but that's largely a local American matter. It's not, a, it's not an internationalist phenomenon. So this is my response to Roy uh, a decade late. The book is my response to Roy. And I make several arguments. Uh, the first point is, Roy is right. The, the crisis of the left is very real, but it also affects Muslim politics. The Muslim political landscape today is dominated by the right, by conservative movements. You have the Muslim Brotherhood on the center right. You have the Salafi movement on the far right. Um, you have uh, liberal Muslims, for instance, may gravitate towards Sufism, the so-called mystical branch of Islam. But where do you go if you're a young, progressive Muslim uh, interested in issues of race and inequality and gender equality and anti-imperialism. Why is there no Islamic left? This is a question one hears often from young Muslim activists, right? And something that, uh, that needs to be addressed. And I argue that given the absence of, the, of an Islamic left, the black freedom movement fills this political void. And that's another reason why we should talk about race. There is, as I said, at least a century of political interaction between black America and the Islamic world, starting in the early 20th century. You get movements from the Moorish Science Temple to the Garveyite movement to the Nation of Islam. Uh, 
and so forth that drew on Islamic history to build identity, mobilize politically, making art, literature, and in so doing, they created a rich internationalist heritage, what I call the Black Muslim Archive. This archive, this history of Islam in the Black Atlantic, is attractive to Muslim youth today, not because it is the oldest Islamic presence in the West, but also because of its progressivism, its radicalism. In short, it's not quite true, as Roy argues, that the only radical or internationalist protest movement available to Western youth today is political Islam, or Salafism, as Roy says. There is the black freedom movement in all its glory. From Brazil to the Caribbean to Harlem, the cultures of freedom of the African diaspora, the black Atlantic are inspiring youth movements around the world. Today we have Black Panthers in Brazil, South India, and New Zealand. For my purposes, I'm interested in Muslim youth movements, and there are Muslim youth movements inspired by the Black Panthers and the Black Power movement in France, Belgium, England, Greece, and Sweden. In Sweden, in uh, Gothenburg, there's a movement called Pantararna, which is a, a local version of the Black Panthers. So the Muslim youth today, and I would say especially in Europe, African-American Islam, as represented by Malcolm X, offers a progressive internationalist alternative. It links the local with the global. It connects struggles against racism with struggles against imperialism in a way that no mainstream Islamic movement does. I argue that with the end of the Cold War, and especially after 9-11, the black freedom movement is the alternative for progressive Muslims. I'm interested in this turn towards race activism. So that's the book I set out to write, right? Looking at various youth cultures that have emerged during the 9-11 decade, cultural responses to war on terror policies. I thought music would be a powerful lens to which to view threes, these interactions in emerging movements. Music disseminates black history, as James Baldwin uh, has told us. It is through music that Muslim youth overseas learn about Garvey, Malcolm, and the black freedom struggles. And music has long been used by youth everywhere to protest, proclaim identity, and interpret the world. But given the dominance of the Salafi Islamist movement with its opposition to music, this has meant that debates about music, its permissibility and purpose are central to contemporary Muslim youth culture today. So that's what I wanted to do. But then as I began researching, I find that music, I find that music is also a mechanism of social control, increasingly deployed by states to quote unquote moderate, uh, moder to, to moderate Muslim youth. In America and Europe, as Islam inflected cultural forms reach the mainstream, State officials, counterterrorism counter -terrorism specialists are carefully watching, listening, wondering if these music flows are undermining national cohesion and how they can be incorporated into a politics of counter-extremism. Music, in short, is at the heart of the cultural war on terror and efforts to win Muslim hearts and minds. So that's my long introduction, my preamble, just an overview of the book. I'm trying to tell the story of the West's encounter of the Islamic world through music and through, through the angle of music and black internationalism. I look at cities in Latin America, North America, Europe, and, um, and North Africa. I talk about different types of music, and particularly how governments are trying to use art and music to promote a liberal Islam. But, but I'm gonna focus uh, particularly on US policy towards European Muslims. More broadly, uh, America's attempts to integrate Europe's ethnic and racial minorities. So let's begin in fall 2005. Some of you may remember fall 2005, the French riots. Um, in late October 2005, riots erupted in Clichy-sous-Bois, a suburb in eastern Paris, and soon spread to other parts of the capital and then to different cities in France. Some of you may remember, some of you may, are too young to remember. Um, the unrest raged for weeks, prompting the government on November 8, 2005 to declare a state of emergency in France. The French riots of 2005 were a turning point. As France's suburban ghettos blazed, the European press warned that certain immigrant groups were simply unassimilable and wondered if France and Europe were developing an American-style race problem. Is America's racial past Europe's future? In the US, on the other hand, the initial cable news talks about how the riots had discredited the French model of integration soon gave way to uneasy discussions about what might happen if that unrest, if the disturbances reached America's shores. The unrest cast doubt on Europe's self-image and brought home the realization that Muslim youth could trouble the transatlantic alliance, or so the argument was made. Um, American officials soon began warning that the alienation and segregation of European Muslims could weaken our European allies. The US National Intelligence Council's report on global trends published soon thereafter mentions the French riots and warns that Europe's economic downturn and the nativist surge could deepen the Muslim sense of alienation and lead to instability. The U.S. government soon began reaching out to Muslim youth in Europe, sending prominent Muslim Americans to talk about uh, 
the merits of American multiculturalism, organizing seminars on affirmative action and ethnic statistics, funding AGO NGOs in underprivileged neighborhoods across Europe. American diplomats also began inviting European Muslims to come experience, experience American diversity firsthand and see that American Muslims are not oppressed, quote unquote. Hoping these trips would soften uh, Muslim attitudes towards the US, or as NPR put it, make terrorism's recruiters less appealing. So most of these initiatives came to light because of WikiLeaks, which showed American diplomats candidly discussing the plight of minorities in Europe and advocating ways to intervene discreetly, quote unquote discreetly. I would say the WikiLeaks cables that stirred the most anger in European capitals were those where US diplomats castigated allies, Britain, France, Holland, for mistreating their minorities. And the cables released in late December 2010 showed American diplomats unimpressed with European efforts to combat this new threat, so-called, and revealed that US embassies were funding Muslim organizations in various European cities. The US embassy in London, uh, for instance, had launched a project called, uh, called Reverse Radicalism and tried to promote understanding between the good British government and British Muslims, right? The, the claim was that the British government could not communicate so the, with its, its Muslim uh, citizens, so the State Department stepped in to mediate. The London cables also described the embassy's efforts to reach, quote unquote, moderate Muslim communities. The problem is there's little agreement between the US and European state on what moderate means. The British press was unhappy with the State Department's secret campaign to de-radicalize British Muslims, and especially with the embassy's outreach to mosques, which the British consider radical, such as the Finsbury uh, Park Mosque in North London that had produced the shoe bomber and so on. And this is a recurring theme in this discussion. American and European officials can't really agree on what constitutes a moderate Muslim. But it's in France, perhaps not surprisingly, that the State Department's activities have triggered the most outrage. The dispatches from the US Embassy in Paris are blunt in their appraisal. One cable states, the French have a well-known problem with discrimination against minorities, unquote. Other descriptions read like, other dispatches read like descriptions of pre-civil rights America. One states, the French media remains overwhelmingly white among French elite educational institutions who are only aware that Sciences Po has taken serious steps to integrate, unquote. Um, they're describing France as pre-integration. Right? So according to these reports, Washington's fear is not only that young French Muslims will gravitate towards extremism, but that ethnic conflict will weaken France. One cable warns explicitly that if France does not succeed in giving minorities true political representation, it will become weaker, more divided, and a less effective ally as a result, right? unquote. So American officials are fully aware of France's reluctance to accept the American model of integration. One cable states, direct development assistance is probably not a good idea, yet embassy officials still organize various outreach projects involving exchange programs, festivals, and media appearances, all to raise awareness of America's civil rights movement, or what diplomats in shorthand call diversity management. Right? Through such efforts and by pressing the French government to improve the lot of French Muslims, the embassy has tried to alter French Muslim perceptions of the US to show that America respects Islam and is engaged for good in the Arab Muslim world, unquote. Needless to say, these depictions of France as a prejudiced country in need of American aid were not well received. France has long viewed itself as immune to American-style race politics, priding itself on providing refuge since the late 19th century to African Americans fleeing discrimination. The cable that drew the most indignant response from French state officials was written by then Ambassador Craig Stapleton at the height of the, of the riots in 2000, November 2005. He said, the real problem is the failure of white Christian France to view its dark-skinned and Muslim compatriots as citizens in their own rights, unquote. Speaking on a television show, former Prime Minister Dominique de Villepin said, he scoffed, he said, this cable shows the limits of American diplomacy. He added that US diplomats were wrongly viewing uh, France's urban crisis through their own history, viewing France's urban crisis through a religious and a racial prism. That's, uh, they're imposing sort of American, it's an American view of matters. The French media, like the British and Dutch media, was riled by revelations that the US had since 2003 been deeply involved in the integration process, pushing to shift the media discourse to get French leaders to generate, to, to generate public debate about affirmative action and multiculturalism, as well as to reform French history curricula and to encourage French museums to exhibit the contributions of minorities. As French journalists observed, all these cultural initiatives had a Cold War precedent. 
Let me talk for a moment about American cultural diplomacy during the Cold War as it forms the inspiration for, um, for the current efforts. After World War II, as you know, French and British colonies gained their independence and they soon found themselves wooed by two superpowers eager to expand their spheres of influence. Washington's efforts were complicated by Soviet propaganda, which tended to focus on racial discrimination and protests in the American South. The Soviets deliberately highlighted uh, the racial st strife down South for propaganda purposes. The Eisenhower administration, in response, began eyeing Moscow's, Moscow's Islamic underbelly, quote unquote, as one diplomat put it, and came to see the plight of Muslims in the Central Asian territories as Russia's weak point. In the early 50s, both superpowers began using Islam as a political weapon. The Soviets would send Muslims from their Central uh, Asian territories to, to, to Hajj, on the, on the pilgrimage to Hajj, to show the wider Muslim world that Soviet Muslims were well treated. The State Department, in turn, would launch a media campaign to highlight Soviet mistreatment of Muslims in Central Asia. The Americans, the Americans also set up uh, Radio Liberty, Radio Free Europe, recruiting Uzbeks, Chechens, and other Central Asian Muslims, and began broadcasting to Muslims behind our Iron Curtain. The broadcasts in Chechen and Uzbek and so on, especially after Nikita Khrushchev's crackdown on Muslim institutions in 1956, would highlight Moscow's repressive policies. The book to read on these initiatives is, as you probably know the book already, it's called The Cultural Cold War, The CIA and the World of Arts and Letters, an outstanding book by Oxford historian Francis Stoner Saunders, published in 1999, that shows that the Marshall Plan and the post-war reconstruction of Europe included an elaborate cultural apparatus. Right? As part of the cultural offensive against communism, the CIA, through the Congress of Cultural Freedom, covertly underwrote art exhibits and tours of the Boston Symphony Orchestra in Europe, paid for the filming of George Orwell's 1984, and in 1953 launched the liberal left-leaning literary and political journal Encounter, under the stewardship of Irvin Kristol. Um, and also, American intelligence would also support the Arabic Review, an Arabic language uh, anti-communist magazine called El Majella, based, based in Munich. The war on terror in Western Europe today also has a cultural side. And while more discreet than covert and often implemented in partnerships with local NGOs, the, cultural, the current cultural offensive is underpinned by a Cold War framework Namely, the notion that the war on terror is a battle of ideas and ideologies, and the belief that the flow of information that brought down communism can similarly defeat jihadist ideology. To win the cyber war in an age of global terrorism, look to the Cold War, argues Mike McConnell, former US Director of National Intelligence, who was called for a revisiting of President Eisenhower's policies. From the mid-50s onwards, the US supported Cold Warriors across the political spectrum, right, of different ideological background. Likewise, the US today is similarly supporting a, rage, a range of Muslim organizations and publications deemed moderate, quote unquote moderate. And while this diplomacy is partly intended to counter the rise of the right, in some countries it has actually inflamed the, the right further. So another, I just to talk about American initiative, another initiative that has drawn some attention in Europe is Project Minerva. Has anyone heard of Project Minerva? Probably not, neither had I. Uh, I hadn't either until I went to Paris in the summer of 2012 to speak to Riva Castoriano, who's a well-known uh, uh, scholar of migration and diversity in Europe. Um, Al Steppen, who teaches here, suggested I talk to her. So I went to see her. She directs a major proje uh, research project on, on migration. And I said, Riva, I'm interested in American efforts to integrate sort of American uh, initiatives in the banlieue and the urban periphery. And she says, oh, we're actually funded by the Pentagon, you know? Um, <laughs> She says, we're funded by the Pentagon. She was referring to the Department of Defense's Minerva project. Uh, this is a research initiative that Secretary of Defense Robert Gates announced in April 2008, inviting universities around the world to apply for an estimated $50 million for research areas of importance to American national security. Gates declared that Minerva would support social science research in areas such as Chinese military, studies of ta uh, terrorist organizations' ideologies, future ideological trends within Islam with the aim of solving terrorism challenges. Gates specifically appealed to the discipline of anthropology for help in this effort. Minerva, this project, prompted a debate between American socialists, American socialists, American social scientists, <laughs> sorry. Minerva prompted a debate between American social scientists. Some scholars argued that the American Academy needed to bring its knowledge to bear on policy debates, while others warned that government funding 
would simply skew research towards what the Pentagon defined as the greatest threat, i.e. terrorism and the rise of China, and away from issues like poverty and global warming, which posed a bigger menace to human life. By July 2008, over a thousand anthropologists had, had signed a pledge to not accept Pentagon funding for counterinsurgency research. Since the research initiative included a component identifying moderate Muslim networks, on a quote unquote moderate Muslim networks in France, Germany, and Britain, Minerva would divide European opinion as well, with some universities in France and Sweden taking part, others refusing, fearing the big data project would be used for surveillance. And these fears, uh, as you know, would prove true in June 2013, and the controversy over American sponsored research in Europe erupted again when it emerged that the NSA was collecting the personal data of European citizens. So the debate about research and surveillance is ongoing in Europe. So that's a general outline of the way the US is intervening in European ethnic politics. I want to focus a bit more on music diplomacy. Uh, Cold War diplomacy, as I mentioned, had an artistic and literary, uh, and literary side. There's a new book, uh, a fascinating uh, study, by the way, of, um, of Boris Pasternak's classic novel, Dr. Zhivago, and how it was used in, um, uh, for, for, for propaganda purposes. But back then, music, jazz in particular, was the centerpiece of American Cold War diplomacy towards the Muslim world. It was, it was, jazz was the focus. In response to Soviet propaganda, the Soviet propaganda that I mentioned, the State Department began organizing high-profile jazz tours to alter impressions of the US, sending bands led by Dizzy Gillespie, Count Basie, Louis Armstrong, to abroad to improve America's image. As Adam Clayton Powell, the Democratic congressman from Harlem, who conceived this, these, of these tours, to respond to Soviet propaganda, he persuaded President Eisenhower to support the project, telling him, one dark face from the US is of as much value as millions of dollars in economic aid, unquote. So the main goal of these tours was to bolster alliances and persuade non-aligned states that the US was different from the European colonial powers and the Soviet Union. The jazz tours began in 1956, specifically targeting areas where communism was gaining a foothold and zones rich in oil and uranium. As Penny Von Eschen writes in her pioneering study, Satchmo Blows Up the World, the tours often moved in tandem with covert CIA operations. Um, these integrated bands visited the Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, and beyond. The bands were intended to be symbols of the triumph of democracy. Jazz was supposed to represent uh, American, America's liberal ideals and its improvisational pluralism and race transcending uh, universalism. Um, the irony, as you all know, is that these black musicians were deployed to improve the country's image and legitimize policies at a time when the US was still a Jim Crow nation. There was such opposition to these tours at home that when the jazz artists were touring, State Department officials at home scrambled to prevent images of the tours from reaching Southern segregationists. In this task, ironically, they were aided by the smith munt Act, the so-called anti-propaganda law, which was passed in 1948 by Congress, by Congress, which then suspected that the State Department was full of communists, right? The, the, law, the law sort of bans the output of Voice of America and so on. The, you know, the, the output that's directed as propaganda overseas should not be directed at American citizens. American citizens should not be subject to propaganda. Um, at any rate, the tours which ended in the 1970s are widely considered a success. The Harvard scholar Ingrid Munson speaks of the extraordinary success of the jazz tours. Pianist Dave Brubeck thought the jazz ambassadors, he argued that the jazz ambassadors helped end the Cold War. Um, just last week, Quincy Jones was on Leonard Lopez show here in New York, and he also made the argument that music and communication brought down the Berlin Wall. So this is a widespread idea, uh, though here at SIPA we know that it wasn't the jazz tours that brought down the Soviet Union, right? Uh, but I do think the cultural impact was quite extraordinary, musically speaking. As a result of these tours, you got some incredible collaborations. Duke Ellington, following his tour of India and Afghanistan and Iran, uh, would compose a record called The Far East Suite, 1966, has a track called Isfahan, which you should definitely listen to. Uh, likewise, um, Dave Brubeck was in Turkey. Dave Brubeck was touring in Turkey in Istanbul. He, was, he heard a rhythm that Turkish street musicians were playing. This would inspire him to compose Rondo Ala Turk. And at the 50th anniversary of Rondo Ala Turk at Lincoln Center in 2009, he brought up on stage a number of Turkish artists that he had mentored over the decades. Um, so the, the collaborations are fascinating. Louis Armstrong in Egypt, uh, Sanra in Egypt, Randy Weston in Morocco. There, 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 some amazing collaborations grew out of these, of these tours. Anyhow, the tours are deemed, the jazz tours are deemed to have been so successful that they were revived after 
directed at Muslim communities in Europe and beyond. So a word on the uses of, of hip hop. Um, in 2005, the Jazz Diplomacy Initiative of the Cold War was revived in a program called Rhythm Road, a partnership of the State Department, Jazz Lincoln Center, and the Brooklyn Academy of Music. This time, though, the music of choice was hip hop. In 2005, the State Department began sending hip hop envoys. That's an official position, hip hop envoy, hip hop ambassador, ambassadors, rappers, dancers, DJs, to perform and speak in different parts of Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. Tony Blackman, a spoken word artist from Washington, was the first to be appointed to this position, hip hop ambassador. The tours have covered the broad arc of the Muslim world from West Africa to Indonesia. The artist stage performances, so I mean, West Africa to Indonesia, but also European cities. For our purposes, also European cities with sizable Muslim populations. The artists will hold, uh, will stage performances, hold workshops, and then talk about the freedoms that they enjoy as Muslim Americans. So just to explain why hip hop was chosen. As I mentioned in my, uh, in my intro, a very rich intermingling between Islam and African American music took place during the 20th century, starting with jazz. Some scholars go even earlier to the blues, but starting with jazz, I start with jazz. But beyond jazz, Islamic motifs and notions of Pan-African solidarity have, have been heard in soul music and R&B since the 50s, reflecting the social and cultural changes afoot. But the genre that has absorbed the most Islamic influences is hip hop. This is, detailed, this is detailed in the book. I'll just briefly, briefly say that Islamic motifs in Arabic terms have threaded the fabric of hip hop since its genesis in 1973 when Africa Bambara founded the group the Zulu Nation, reflecting the range of Islamic and quasi-Islamic ideologies and cultures that have coexisted for decades in America's urban centers. The, the, the intermingling is so rich such that in March 1991, the hip hop magazine, The Source, devoted an entire issue titled Islamic Summit to the relationship between Islam and hip hop. In that golden age of so-called golden age of politically conscious rap, groups like Rakim and Public Enemy invoked Islam, excerpted the speeches of Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad. Some music critics argue that hip hop back then was political because of its relationship to Muslim movements, particularly the nation of Islam. As hip hop went mainstream in the mid 90s, these illusions were broadcast around the world, transforming cultures and identities. And you begin to get hip hop scenes around the world. Through hip hop, Muslim youth would be exposed to black history and non-Muslims were introduced to Islam and you see this process in Europe taking place. It's, it's richly illustrated by the European context. The fascination with the African American experience and the civil rights movement that one sees in Europe's urban periphery is the result of these cultural flows. And state officials are aware of this. They realize that an American dream exists in Europe's Muslim ghettos and that it's very much a black American dream. Diplomats, American diplomats would note how the rise of Barack Obama, a leader of African and Muslim ancestry, riveted young Europeans, particularly in the Muslim heavy urban periphery, and that Obama's rise would sharply improve perceptions of the US, which had soured during the Bush years. At any rate, during the 90s, hip hop goes global, but it's also during these years, during the mid 90s, after the first Gulf War, that Islam gets globalized, right? Not for the first time, but you see a re-globalization of, of Islam through migration in new media. The Saudis, after the, the first Gulf War, after the Gulf War, facing intense domestic opposition for hosting American troops, stepped up efforts to export their Salafi interpretation, propagating a supposedly authentic, timeless Islam that is free of all cultural innovation and openly opposed to Sufi and Shia practice. And of course, this is when the internet enters the equation. So the globalization of hip hop and Islam converge and overlap with all kinds of cultural repercussions. I don't have time here to talk about certain fashions and, and, and so on. Uh, but uh, one could argue that in the US it was hip hop that paved the way for the rise of the Salafi movement in the mid 90s. Uh, the Salafi movement, the conservative uh, Muslim movement was quite influential in the US during the mid 90s. And, 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 and I would say hip hop partly prompted this interest. It was the Malcolm X fad of the early 90s, uh, sparked by Afrocentrist hip hop and Spike Lee's film Spike Lee's biopic that led many young Americans to read the civil rights leader's autobiography, become interested in African and Islamic history. And as the nation declined, as the nation of Islam declined in the mid 90s, these young converts would gravitate towards the Salafi movement. And again, these cultural flows would, would reach Europe and circulate back to the US. Um, so this was a relationship between hip hop and Islam in the 80s and 90s. Hip hop would transmit black history around the world, and just as reggae in the 70s disseminated Rastafarianism, hip hop would broadcast African American Islam and all its variants. After 9 11, however, this relationship changes and begins to draw greater 
scrut government scrutiny. The turning point was when a young American by the name of John Walker Lint was found behind enemy lines in Afghanistan in October 2001. Just how did this middle class boy from Marin County end up joining the Taliban, right? That was the question. His online postings, experts argued, offered a clue. In hip hop chat rooms, Lint often posed as black, adopting the name Professor J. Um, and experts would trace the young man's journey to radicalism to the age of 12 when his mother took him to see Spike Lee's film uh, Malcolm X, after which he read the autobiography of Malcolm X and began listening to hip hop. American and European officials would thereafter note the centrality of rap and Malcolm X to Muslim youth politics and argue that a moderate understanding of the Malcolm X narrative is critical to protecting at-risk Muslim youth. So from then on, hip hop would emerge as the music of choice for American public diplomacy, for perception management as it's called, and strategic communication with young Muslims around the world. Why, why hip hop again? Because of American hip hop's long standing relationship to Islam, these, the, these connections that I've mentioned. Neither hard rock nor heavy metal has the same appeal to young Muslims. And if you look at the research on music and interrogation in Iraq and Afghanistan, there's rarely a mention of hip hop. With the exception of Eminem's track, White America, the songs used to break down detainees were almost exclusively hard, hard rock and metal. Hip hop is used more for cultural persuasion. So it's not unusual today to read State Department reports that speak of hip hop as a natural connector to the Muslim world and to hear officials call for the leveraging of hip hop in US foreign policy. So just to place this, this, uh, this, uh, this, this part on hip hop in its policy context. Um, the policy context, the, the larger policy context is this. It's the American debate on extremist, extremism and jihadist violence. And the American debate on, on jihadist violence falls roughly into two schools of thought. And one camp is a coalition of realists, leftists, and post-colonialists who think extremism is a response to an American policy or set of policies. And on the other side are those neoconservatives and liberal hawks who think Islamist violence grows out of ideology and narratives and not just opposition to American action. To put it in SIPA terms, this is a debate between realists who think this is that it's a state policy that's causing blow blowback. This is state policy is the independent variable. So it's realists on one side and liberals and constructivists on the other who think it's identity and discourse and culture. This debate is ongoing within the government and national security policy. And if the realists, the first camp, advocate a less interventionist foreign policy, offshore balancing is a way to prevent extremism. The liberal hawks who think the roots of violence are cultural or theological are more likely to advocate military intervention or some kind of social engineering. Right? whether it's regime change or modernization. And this camp also spends a great deal of effort studying Muslim scripture and cultural traditions to find a way to disrupt the quote unquote narrative. And herein lie the roots of the new public diplomacy, public diplomacy 2.0 as it's called, that uses music, art, social media, and the discourse of diversity, the discourse of the civil rights movement. And this debate about the origins of extremism maps onto yet another policy debate within, within the national security community over whether Islamists or Sufis make better allies for the United States. The idea that Sufi Islam is more moderate and flexible and compatible with liberalism than interpretations of Islam that come, come out of Arabia has an old colonial uh, genealogy, and it found its way into American academia in the post-war years, imported by European scholars who were establishing some of the first centers for the study of Islam in, in, in North America. I think figures like Bernard Lewis, for instance. Uh, during the early years of the Cold War, liberal orientalists we're arguing that the US should support Sufi brotherhoods to promote modernization and democracy in South Asia, Iran, and North Africa, and to counter Arab-centric Arab Islam. But the realists who are less interventionist and who are more concerned with order and containing the Soviet Union argued that the Islamists were more reliable, that they had greater institutional capacity and ability for social control. Think Zbigniew Brzezinski and what, what he has written on this topic. The realists, as we know, won that debate. Uh, for 40 years, the U.S. would support Islamist groups like the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafi uh, Muslim World League to counter communism, third world nationalism, um, and also to counter uh, some African-American uh, uh, left-wing Muslim groups uh, domestically as well. Um, after 9-11, however, as it became evident that Salafis weren't as apolitical or pro-American as thought, Washington began looking for a new moderate Islam, a quote unquote another moderate option, alternative, and they would, an attention would turn towards Sufism. Government agencies and leading think tanks like RAND and the Nixon Center uh, 
began producing papers, 2002, 2003, and policy memos on how to mobilize Sufism against Salafism. And these ideas were put into practice. Domestically, there would be a crackdown on Salafi Wahhabi mosques, a shutting down of Saudi-sponsored schools here in the United States, and the Gulen movement, the Turkish Sufi movement, whose leader, Fatullah Gulen, lives in, in Pennsylvania, would become the preferred alternative, and Gulen would, would, would be allowed, would be given permission to build schools and centers across the country. At the international, similarly, at the international level, both the Bush and Blair governments would begin to promote Sufism as part of a broader war on terror strategy that extended from West Africa to South Asia. In 2003, the National Security Council established a program called Muslim Moral Outreach with a budget of 1.3 billion aimed at, quote unquote, transforming Islam from within by supporting organizations in Muslim countries um, and in Europe that were deemed moderate and compatible with democracy. That is uh, schools, radio stations, magazines, and so on. This ideological project resembled and was in some ways modeled on the State Department's Cold War strategy of supporting opposition currents in the former Soviet Union, except that the post 9-11 campaign had an explicit theological agenda to reform Islamic religious thought and practice. The arts, and especially music, would play a central role in this Sufi strategy, as it was called. Given, again, given the, uh, the uh, the, given that the Salafi movements, given the Salafi opposition to music and, Suf and Sufis, uh, Sufism's use of song and dance, uh, and even dance for worship, music after 9-11 came to be see seen as a quick and easy way to distinguish between moder moderate and radical Muslim, right? A lifestyle criterion to distinguish. And across the Muslim world and Western Europe, where regimes, not just the US and Britain, other regimes have sought to mobilize Sufism, Sufi inflected musical practices from Pakistan's Qawwali to Muslim hip hop, quote unquote, have been deployed to challenge Islamist narratives and to draw youth away from extremism. So it's within this context that we should understand the State Department's music diplomacy of the last decade. Uh, policymakers think music can convey a liberal discourse that can resocialize at risk Muslim youth. Um, a word about American efforts to promote Sufism in Europe. Um, in the mid 2000s, the Blair government began to empower uh, Sufi organizations to counter. Uh, Islamist influence funding various organizations, the Muslim Sufi Council, Council Quilliam, uh, the Quilliam Foundation, again, to balance against to counter the Muslim Council of Britain, which was seen as militant and uncooperative and so on. The British government also set up a program called Preventing Violent Extremism, organized a roadshow of British and American Sufi scholars who travel around Britain speaking to young Muslims. These newly founded Sufi organizations offered a counter narrative that rejected key Salafi ideas and they were close to Washington and openly backed by the State Department. Music and music's role in the, in the public sphere was from the start a key component of the Sufi counteroffensive. Music featured prominently at the Sufi Council's public events and again hip hop was central. Um, as I mentioned, one of the other phenomena one of the last decade is hearing national security elites, terrorism experts, and career diplomats discuss the finer points of flow, bling, and the politics of cool. Um, American and European, everybody has something to say about hip hop nowadays, and the people in government, uh, security officials, and so on. Uh, American and European terrorism experts have expressed concerns, uh, concern over what they call anti-American hip hop, accenting the radicalizing influence of the genre. Others have advocated mobilizing certain sub-styles of hip hop against what they call jihadi cool. Uh, I think the phrase comes from Jessica Stern at Harvard. She speaks of jihadi cool in foreign affairs. Um, and very prominent musicians, classical musicians, are collaborating with hip hop artists and government sponsored projects, trying to integrate radical rappers, so-called hard left rappers, into the mainstream. The renowned French-American cellist Yo-Yo Ma, for example, is now, is now collaborating with a young hip hopper named Lil Buck. All right. I haven't seen these performances, but the joke is that when Yo-Yo Ma does these hip hop shows, he changes his name to Yo Mama. <laughs> terrible joke, terrible joke, I know. Uh, but I haven't seen these shows, you may wanna uh, look them up. Uh, the music diplomacy, I must emphasize, fits into a larger effort to showcase the civil rights movement and the black freedom struggles of the US, starting with the experience of African Muslim slaves in the American South. American policymakers can see that there's a fascination with the civil rights movement and black culture in the Euro European urban periphery, and they are aware that the war on terror and the range of punitive policies directed at Muslim communities in the West have pushed Muslim youth towards race activism and towards African-American history. 
And it's worth thinking about. This is something I try to parse in the book, the, the centrality of black culture and the civil rights movement to American soft power today, right? How did that, how did that happen? Um, the American diplomatic initiatives in Europe also include efforts to export American race policies, what's called American, what's called racecraft. Some scholars call it racecraft. Thus, affirmative action is being promoted by American embassies. The State Department is also pushing American style racial classification and the idea of legal minority status as exists in the US, trying to get European governments to adopt that. There's currently quite a bit of debate over how to label minority communities in Western Europe. Uh, should black uh, Europeans, is that, should that be a legal uh, category, minority status? Should it be a legal minority? Um, should the Muslim neighborhoods in European cities be called ghettos or enclaves? Regarding minority status, legal minority status, the American Embassy in Paris has over the years been making the case for race classification, trying to persuade French politicians to collect ethnic and racial data in the national census and to grant legal minority status to blacks and North Africans. The French government, as you know, does not recognize racial or ethnic difference. So the State Department will bring French activists to Washington to meet with Census Bureau experts and make the case uh, for minority status. Now, to wrap up, is this all working? Yes and no. Right? Judging by Pew's polls, the public diplomacy efforts towards South Asia, North Africa, the Middle East are, are, are not really working. Perceptions of the US are still negative. But in Europe, the record is more mixed. As the New York Times uh, has noted, anti-American sentiment once pervasive in the Balneo neighborhoods of France seems to have all but been, seems to have been all but erased since the election of uh, Mr. Obama, who has proven to be a powerful symbol of hope and a powerful diplomatic tool, unquote. But American efforts to promote Sufism in Britain, for example, have had little success. The efforts are seen as divisive. Michael Mumisa, a cleric and scholar at Oxford, would write an article in The Independence saying that the British and American policy of mobilizing Sufism, mobilizing Sufis as good Muslims against Islamists, as against the bad Islamists, was so in discord and could provoke a civil war within the British Muslim community. These American interventions in Europe are polarizing even beyond the Muslim community. Left-leaning intellectuals and conservatives resent these initiatives and don't like it when American diplomats or journalists say Europe has a race problem or speak of Muslim ghettos. For conservatives, ghettos are a thing of the past in Europe and race is an American obsession. Left intellectuals, in turn, are angered by all the American chatter about Europe's failure to integrate its Muslims when it is US foreign policy that inflames Muslim opinion. They particularly resent efforts to impose uh, American race policies. Um, worth noting as an aside is that American efforts to introduce race classification so inflame French opinion that in May 2013, President Francois Hollande moved to ban the term race altogether from the French Constitution and the country's laws, saying race has no scientific basis. Right? There is a resistance to American thinking, American discourse, and so on. The great irony in all of this is that despite all the grumbling from European intellectuals and politicians, the Muslim youth who are the targets of these programs are quite appreciative. Okay? Young Muslims are aware of the delicate politics involved in accepting American offers and they resent the NSA surveillance and importation of American policing methods to European cities. But a number of Muslim activists and entrepreneurs think their relationship with the American embassy can help leverage concessions from their own governments. Right? So if, uh, uh, one activist, uh, Akru in Brussels, told me that we can ask the Belgian government you know, for financial assistance, they'll say no. But if the American embassy gives us 20,000 euros, the Belgian government, embarrassed, will match it. Right? In closing, in closing, I want to point out that ironically, it has been law enforcement and national security officials who have raised the most poignant questions about the legality of arts diplomacy. Sam Roscoff, a legal scholar who directed the NYPD's intelligence unit, notes that the cultural ambassadors sent overseas by the State Department are selected according to a theological standard. It is generally Sufi-oriented artists and imams that are sent, not Islamists. And he wonders if this doesn't contravene the Establishment Clause, the constitutional provision that says the government should not establish religion or take sides in religious debates, in this case, Muslim debates about the permissibility of music. Others are noting that these performances may violate the anti-propaganda laws, some of which are still on the books, the smith munt Act from 1948, which I mentioned. Performances overseas are being uploaded online where they can be viewed and commented upon by American audiences. And although the smith munt Act was amended last summer to allow VOA, to allow Voice of America, Arabic and Somali programming to broadcast to, uh, to communities within the United States, uh, 
Um, there are still certain publicity and propaganda writers that f prohibit communication between Americans and non-Americans, right? Um, and when these, when these shows are uploaded online, people often comment on them on YouTube. <coughs> Um, so this debate is ongoing, and the larger conversation about music, Sufism, and Muslim extremism is back, as Stuart mentioned, because of ISIS. With the emergence of ISIS, there's talk again of extremist rap and the need for a counter-narrative, as President Obama uh, has called it on 60 Minutes. Politico in the last month has run three stories on whether Obama, President Obama is losing the propaganda war, if the State Department is winning the Twitter war, and on the supposed role of 50 Cent's rapper 50 Cent's in radicalizing young Brits young Britons, like Abdul Majid Abdul Bari, the young man who allegedly committed the beheadings, right? So I argue, I've argued that the pendulum tends to swing back, tends to swing from the liberal hawks who want to promote a moderate Sufi Islam to the realists and leftists who are opposed to such social engineering. Right now, the pendulum seems to have swung back towards the liberal interventionists who are again talking about the need for a reformation and the need to mobilize uh, Sufism. In conclusion, the American initiatives to gain the goodwill of European Muslims through financial assistance and public diplomacy signal a new era. This isn't the first time American diplomacy has tried to curry favor with Muslims in Europe, but the Cold War initiatives, as we know, were directed at Muslims in the Soviet Union, an enemy state. The current initiatives are aimed at Muslims in Western Europe, and that is new. Western states have a long history of intervening in the Muslim world to protect and empower religious minorities, Christians and Jews generally, but it is unprecedented for allied Western states to court each other's minorities. It appears that the great game of the 21st century, the ideological and geopolitical tussles centered around post-colonial Africa and the Middle East is increasingly playing out in Europe's urban periphery. Thank you all. Let me, sh let me just show... Um, I want to show you a couple of, I usually play music after I talk about how do that today. And I want to show you some headlines uh, from, from newspapers around the world um, responding, sort of responses to the cultural diplomacy. This is Rashida Dati, who's uh, vice president of the French Conservative Party, the UMP. And here she is saying, she's sort of tired of people referring to the banlieue as the Bronx. And here she's saying Paris is not the Bronx. And then further down she says, uh, she says, we haven't reached that level of lawlessness yet. By the way, we're pretty lawless, but we haven't reached that yet, right? So the, the image of the Bronx that they, that, that they have in their minds is the 1970s, of course, right? So there's this, there's this image there. So that's from uh, the French media. Just to show you some other clips, this is, show you another headline. This is when um, the Telegraph, freaking out a little bit over US efforts, the secret campaign to reverse radicalization and uh, reaching out to mosques and so on. Um, this is a hysterical headline from Le Point, a French newspaper. It says, the US is going out to conquer the banlieue, right? Um, finally, no, penultimate one. This is, some of you may have heard of um, Salman Ahmed of a Pakistani rock group called Junoon. Um, he's one of the people who in 2002, 2003, began arguing that the best response to extremist ideology is music, right? Is Sufism conveyed through music, right? So he wrote a book called Rock and Roll Jihad. Um, he's now running for office in Pakistan, right? So this is, this is a response. This is when he toured in Britain, trying to reach uh, uh, young Muslims in Britain with his guitar, right? He grew up in New York, loves Led Zeppelin and so on. Um, last one, this is a headline from the Times of India, where the headline says, Pakistani Sufis are victims of the West's great expectations. This is, there was a bombing at a Sufi shrine in, uh, in, in Punjab um, in, in April 2011, and the editorial argues that the fact that the West has tried to mobilize Sufism has simply made uh, Sufis be seen as allies of empire and so on, and it's made them a target. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you all. Thanks, Hisham. Sure. Um, we're going to do some uh, questions and things like that. So if people have questions, you could uh, come up to the microphone, introduce yourself. And uh, um, I just have a quick, a couple of quick ones, one kind of big picture and one big picture smaller one. picture, sure. technology. Sure. Um, but big picture, you know, the thing that I was, and I mentioned this in my opening, uh, the thing that I was most interested in um, 
is kind of this, what I would, I mean, before I got to know this topic from reading your book and, and talking to you and things like that, um, is uh, the connection between American hip hop and rap and, uh, and what, you know, sort of the connection to more moderate Islamic movements around the world, and that would be sort of counterintuitive to me just the way I'd be thinking about the evolution of, of some of these countercultural um, music uh, movements that occurred in the United States. Uh, so rap and hip hop were, you know, in many ways born and raised uh, with messages and movements of political resistance and opposition and things like that. And you had black liberation theology built into them and Nation of Islam and, and on, in some of the uh, different groups and some of the uh, different strands. So I would just sort of naturally think that they might be attracted to more global Salafist uh, movements because the way I see the global Salafist movements, and we're going to have a little disagreement on this because I, I should let you know I've known Hisham for a long time and we have some disagreements on some of these issues, uh, friendly and intellectually uh, respectful, um, <laughs> usually. Um, because the global Salafist movements, many of them, especially the ones that are inspired by someone like Sayyid Qutb and those sorts of movements, these are, these are global anti-colonial, anti-Western ideological movements, or at least uh, often some of these groups portray themselves as that. And I'm wondering why there's a disconnect, let's say, between anti-West, you know, anti anti-Americanism to a certain extent, um, uh, some of these movements that would rise up counterculturally, uh, why, if they were Islamic and they were countercultural, why they wouldn't be attracted to some of these more anti-Western uh, globalized movements as they would present themselves. Why isn't American hip hop drawn to these movements? Yeah, or why wouldn't some people that would be drawn to, you know, if there are rap songs about, you know, cop killing and, and, uh, and things that have racial elements, and I hate, I don't mean to go against Francois Lan to mention the word race, but, uh, you know, if they bring uh, racial elements into it um, and Western elements into it from an American, you know, perspective of the long history of racial conflict and slavery and all the different elements that would play into some of these movements, legitimately, obviously. Um, globally, some of the Salafists are playing the same things globally about colonialism and imperialism, and some of the same strains would be in their ideological movement. So just wondering why you're seeing it as a disconnect. One is sort of drawn to anti-Salafist violence, and one, you know, is more of a moderate uh, political opposition movement, if I could sort of call it that. Um, I'm not sure I see a disconnect. Um, I mean, I'm, you know, one of the arguments that... Um, well, you don't think they support the radical movement. You don't think they, you say they don't support. I mean, you, look, yeah. you have hip hoppers, you know, hip hoppers uh, run the, the, the political spectrum, right? You have hip hoppers across the political <clears throat> spectrum. Uh, you have those who are, you know, hard left. You have those who are, uh, you know, interested in Sufism, those who are interested in Salafism, those interested in 5% or Nation of Islam. Um, and, you know, the, the intermingling is, 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 is fascinating to me. Um, uh, you know, I mean, one of the reasons that, you know, one of the things I mean, one of the reasons that the U.S. looked positively upon these movements, Salafi movement, Muslim Brotherhood, and so on, in the 60s, was that they were seen to be conservative and quietist, right? Uh, they're not necessarily revolutionary. One of, yeah, you can't hear me. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Good. I'm glad you missed all of that, by the way. Um, yeah, me too. Um, no, I said one of the reasons that U.S. Uh, you know, I interview a couple of diplomats in the book. I interview uh, Richard Murphy, right, who was uh, American, uh, was a diplomat attaché, a young diplomat in Saudi Arabia in the early 60s. And I was looking, you know, I used to work with Manning Marable on his Malcolm X project, um, uh, the late Manning Marable, and looking at the impact, sort of the history of Malcolm, his travels around the world, and particularly this, the globalization of Malcolm, right, and the appeal of Malcolm X as an oppositional figure and so on. And you know, in you know, doing research at the National Archive in Maryland, I found a number of sort of dispatches, uh, these diplomatic cables, uh, about Malcolm's visit to Saudi Arabia and Egypt, and Saudi and Egypt, signed by Richard Murphy. And I went to see Richard. I went to see Dick Murphy, and you know, asking him about you know what the cables were talking about was largely they're worried about this radical, this bla the black radicalism here in the United States. They're worried about this movement and the uh, you know the civil unrest and so on. And once, in one of the arguments that they made was that uh, movements such as the Salafi movement, right, could help neutralize, right, some of the some of the black militant organizations of that era, right. Um, and so, when you ask, you know, people like Murphy and others, why was the Muslim World League, a Salafi organization, allowed to set up in Washington and New York? And they said, we thought it could rectify, sort of bring uh, groups such as Nation of Islam and so on to into the orthodox, in, into Muslim orthodoxy. 
Um, so back then, you know, Salafi movement was not necessarily seen as oppositional. Um, and then you begin to get in the ninth, you know, I mentioned a figure, uh, I mentioned a guy named Napoleon, right? I caught a show that he did in Brussels. Napoleon was part of Tupac Shakur's crew. Um, he's now become Muslim and he travels the world as a Salafi evangelist speaking out against hip hop. But he's a former hip hopper who still has, you know, still adopts hip hop styles and, and you know, dress and so on, but has embraced Salafism, right? So, I mean, they're not necessarily oppositional, you know, hip hop and Salafism, uh, you do see a great deal of mixing in the fashion and the language and, and often in the capitalist drive, right? The, the, the getting paid uh, ethos. Yeah, I'm talking more about the groups that have springboarded off Salafism into radicalism and terrorism. Okay. You know, which there are groups obviously define themselves like that, and there's mm -hmm. a tiny minority of Salafists uh, in the world. Yeah, the Cold War, absolutely, and, and you know, as you, as you mentioned, you know, you had Christian fundamentalists in the United States, uh, anti-communists that supported Islamic fundamentalists during the Cold War for the reasons that you described, and they saw Salafism as a devout, um, you know, an austere uh, element of religion that was anti, because uh, uh, the communists were godless and atheists, so they mm -hmm. were sort of on the same side of, of God uh, during the Cold War. But I'm talking about the post-Cold War period, I'm talking about the rise of, of you know, a group like Al-Qaeda and others that are, mm -hmm. are inspired by... What well, do they think of hip-hop? Yeah, I mean, I, that, you see, I'm talking about the more, not, the, not the mainstream uh, uh, Salafists, but the radicalized Salafists, and why, um, if you have hip-hop music that sees themselves as sort of counterculture, oh, okay. anti-establishment, why they're not necessarily drawn to the more radicalized uh, branches of Salafism. Well, Salafis tend to frown upon music. Yeah, that's the first thing. Uh, they tend to frown upon music, and the gentleman that I mentioned, Napoleon, is, is one such person. Um, uh, again, the, the Salafi, the Muslim conservative critique of, of music, of hip-hop in particular, is similar to the Christian conservative critique, right? The excesses, the language, the, the bling, and so on. Um, so, I mean, the Salafis, you do get some Salafi, the militant Salafi that you're talking about, uh, talking about Malcolm X, talking about black history, uh, but generally they steer clear of hip-hop. Right? They see it as corrupting and so on. They generally steer of clear, clear of hip hop, and you have a number of hip hoppers who will become, embrace Salafism, and just do a cappella, uh, non instrumental, sort of religious, uh, re religious songs and so on. You know, I don't want to get too much more into this, but if you get to the Takfiri traditions and things like that, you're going to get radicals that actually use things that they despise or abhor, you mm -hmm. know, um, in disguise almost. And that's when you see a group like ISIS, which would. Uh, which we'd be totally opposed to is something ISIS like hip hop. Are they releasing hip hop? Is, are they yeah, releasing hip -hop and rap. Tracks? Yeah, they are. Really? Absolutely. Um, and but that's not surprising. This is not you know going against things that that uh, that they would say would defy the religion. They would use for instrumental purposes mm. for what they see as a global revolution. That's not it's not new. I mean, this happens in these different radical movements for you know. Okay. a long period of time. People can come up and ask questions. It's going to happen at the microphone. You, um, one real super quick one before people, people come up there. Uh, do you, you know, the group Soldiers of Allah, uh, you know, this kind of flash in the pan group that existed in the 90s. But one thing that was interesting, uh, interesting about them was they, in the, early, in the uh, late 90s and into the early 2000s and after 9-11, um, they tried to have a web presence um, and they were sort of one of the innovators on the web uh, for a period of time. Uh, and then they got hijacked by radicals who sort of were, you know, just sort of flooding the zone and, and essentially the group gave up on, on a web presence and it stayed in existence for a period of time, months and years, mm -hmm. um, not in control of the group anymore, but now in control of radicals in, in these chat rooms. And, you know, they were under surveillance by the LAPD, uh, the different things that were going on, as we know, you know, in this city and other cities around the world uh, to try to do surveillance. So they actually started using this Soldiers of Allah, a couple of the websites or chat rooms Rooms to try to, you know, I wouldn't you know, call it entrapment or whatever. They, it was kind of a law enforcement enterprise. But do you see a challenge with that kind, that side of technology? You know, where if you have uh, social media being used, uh, do you, is there a concern that you know law enforcement is going to be uh, engaging in sort of surveillance or radicals are going to oh, hijack I mean, them? Are young Muslims concerned that they're being surveilled? Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and a rhetorical question, I guess. NSA, NYPD. Uh, yeah, you name it. I yeah. mean, and yeah, around I, the right. world, you know. Right. I mean, that's yeah. the irony. You know, it got hijacked and then it was used by law enforcement, you know, and I would imagine that's going on in, in a much bigger way now, uh, yeah. more around the world, absolutely. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you for that excellent presentation. My name is Jose Ramirez. I'm a first year student here at SIPA. And I am interested in hearing more about, uh, you mentioned the case of uh, Jose Padilla, uh, and who is a uh, Puerto Rican and who became radicalized and went to Afghanistan and now is in, in jail for acts of uh, terrorism. How do these radicalized movements transfer over to 
uh, other ethnic groups, like Latin American groups. Uh, and back home in, the, in Puerto Rico, the media framed it as uh, an anomaly. Everyone was like shocked. How does this guy get there? And, and I, and I want to hear more about how the melting uh, fault of cultures uh, uh, occur to, to, for uh, people you know, like Padilla uh, transform into rad radicalized. Um, in the book, I talk about um, sort of constructions of Islam. Um, I'm, uh, you know, I, I, used, I used to work with um, Open Society Institute, Open Society Foundation. Uh, they have an office in London. They have an office in Brussels, an office here. And they have a great program called At Home in Europe. Um, and the program looks at sort of the status of immigrants, the conditions of immigrants in 14 European cities from Sweden to Holland to Spain and so on. And across much of Western Europe, you have several factors. You have sort of, you have right-wing movements, anti-immigrant movements. You have policies that often persecute, uh, you know, policies targeting Muslim communities, whether it's the headscarf or minaret building or so on. Um, and then you have hostile media coverage, right? So in these cities, these are the three things, three indices that they look for, and you see this in a number of cities. If you look at Latin America, I mean, I talk about Latin America as, as an alternative, right? It's, it's very curious. In Latin America, you don't have this. You know, I have a couple of chapters on Brazil, and. Um, and Islam in the Caribbean and in Brazil, you don't have any of this, right? For some reason, right, uh, we tend to think of the encounter between Islam and the West as necessarily tense. It's gonna lead to a clash of cultures. It's gonna lead to, you know, back, you know blowback and backlash and so on. Um, in Latin America, it's a different story, right? You don't have the organized hostility, right, towards Muslims. You don't have the, um, uh, you don't have the state policies targeting this particular community. Um, and the media coverage tends to be not as shrill, right? And argue that that's a particular construction that's partly because of Latin America's relationship to the Muslim world, to the Middle East and South Asia and West Africa. It doesn't have the same history of colonialism and so on. Um, but it leads to a different, at least to a different kind of attraction towards the Islamic world, right? Um, and so the history of Latin American Orientalism is, is, you know, I can't talk about it too much here, but um, there's a sense of solidarity, there's a sense of uh, anti-colonialism and so on. Um, and, and the discourse is really quite different. Right? The discourse that you get from the, the Brazilian press or, or Brazilian popular culture or Argentine popular culture than what you get in North America. If you just look at television series, for instance, the television series that are produced in the United States, you know, uh, you know any, any, any television series that involves the Muslim world has to do with terrorism, right? Latin America, look at the tele telenovelas that have to do with the Muslim world, it's about love. It's about mixing, it's about culture, it's about music, it's about pop, and so on, right? It's a different relationship, and so at least the different narratives, and you get young people drawn through these narratives, and, but this is, I mean, Jose Pedilla and Hiram Torres are, I mean, very, very rare, you know? You, you really don't get uh, Latinos, uh, Latinas joining uh, these radical movements. People had hands up before, if you want to come up. Yeah, please come up to the mic. It's all being the mic's recorded. Too far. The mic's too far. They can make their way <laughs> to the mic. Yeah. Thanks very much. This is very interesting for me. I happen to be a language teacher and a musician. I'm a jazz musician and an orchestral musician. I've been sent by the State Department over the years with different groups, particularly in the Cold War days, a little less so today. <clears throat> you probably mentioned this already, but uh, besides the fact that I can go on YouTube or television here, programs <laughs> starting in New York City from ethnic or, or music from all over the world right here, what sort, uh, is there some sort of organization in reverse uh, with a political bent coming from the Islamic world to help us in our feelings and our misconceptions and our hostilities toward Muslim world? Uh, there probably are uh, other than the catch as catch can that one is told, well, you can have all this. We have a free press. We have a free YouTube, free internet, right? But I'm just, uh, I want to see, I want to be directed, if I can, to something a little more pointed to, uh, do, to experience in reverse what it is our State Department and maybe our music industry is trying to do on this side of the ocean. Uh, well, look, I focused on, I've, I've spoken about American government uh, diplomacy, uh, cultural diplomacy by the U.S. Uh, governments like Turkey and Morocco and Pakistan also have their cultural diplomacy programs. They send artists here, um, tours around the country. They work with a group called Caravan. I don't know if you're aware of Caravan. Caravan sends, 
sends artists uh, from Turkey and Pakistan to tour the United States. But it's not all government-sponsored diplomacy. There are also NGOs. There are also NGOs doing very interesting work. And some young hip-hop artists, musicians, who don't want to do uh, government-sponsored diplomacy will go with the NGOs. Um, Immortal Technique, well-known hip-hop artist. He does his own grassroots uh, global diplomacy, right? He travels to Pakistan and Afghanistan <coughs> and so on, uh, usually with NGOs. He, he doesn't work with governments and so on. And then, of course, there are NGOs on the other side of the world. Um, there's a group called Gangway Beats, Gangway, based in Berlin, right? Berlin, Germany, right? And they do hip-hop pedagogy, music pedagogy, music to, to rehabilitate young men and um, uh, former gangsters and so on. And they send artists around the world, right? There's a Bronx Berlin program that they run, uh, working with Fordham University. Right? Um, and also, um, they send people to Africa, uh, to Kenya. They have a program with Kenya. So there's, there's a lot out there just to look for it. Sure. John Pearl, a Columbia alumnus. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was very provocative. Uh, I'm troubled by the use of the word moderate in reference to Islam and to Muslims. It came up a lot and comes up a lot in the Syrian rebels. I mean, what the hell is a moderate rebel? It's along with a gun who's trying to destroy the state. <laughs> but anyway, it seems to me that when the word moderate is used in reference to Muslims, what it means is a Muslim who hates the United States less than others or is more malleable by the United States. Because as in the question period was just brought out, a Salafist can be a moderate, a Sufi can be a moderate, I mean, it's, it's, it, 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 does it have any, I mean, it has the implication of some philosophic platonic ideal of the uh, perfect Muslim who is just right in the middle and has all the uh, constructive views that, that, that Islam contains. But it seems to me it's only used in a, in a operative way to find somebody who will do what you want him to do. Um, I talk about this and I talk about how uh, a number of you know, young Muslim leaders really resist that label, right? Uh, they don't want that label. The label is a top-down racial term. It simply means compliant. You're absolutely right, it means compliant. Um, and we tend to speak of moderate black leaders and moderate Muslim leaders. It's a term generally applied to minority groups that are seen as troublesome or, and, and, and so on. Um, I remember uh, Colin Powell landed in Turkey. He was in Turkey, I think 2004 or 2003. And he lands in Turkey, and, he, and his first declaration is Turkey is a moderate Islamic country. And the Turkish president is like, what, what, what do you mean exactly, sir, right? So it's a label, it's, it's, it's meaningless, it's instrumentalized. Um, you're absolutely right, you know. Hi, um, I'm Hari Haran, a first year student here at SIPA. Uh, okay, I'm my, based on my preliminary understanding, uh, jazz diplomacy and hip hop diplomacy, the one major difference I find is that jazz is primarily instrumental, like it's, it's about the instrument, whereas hip hop is a lot about the language and about words and how it's framed. And in that sense, like, you know, like uh, how language is used across countries varies widely and the words used varies widely, whereas jazz could possibly be easily translated anywhere you go. Like, is that, going, is that some kind of an impact on hip hop diplomacy at all? Um, look, if you look at the early writing on jazz diplomacy, the reason why jazz was chosen is because of its inclusiveness. Right, that a jam session, anyone can be part of the jam session. Right, you just you have your instrument, you can blow, you're in. Right, um, it's you know anyone can be. It's you know it's inclusive, it's diverse, it's improvisational, seen as representative of American democracy. Hip hop, on the other hand, is also inclusive. If you can flow, right, if you can just rhyme and so on, you can be part of the cipher, right, the the circle. Uh, but hip hop also was chosen because of its protest, right, because of this the verbal jousting that you're talking about. That, so jazz is seen as to represent inclusiveness and democracy. Hip hop represents protest, right? And the protest comes from the words, right? I mean, from, from the instrumentals, but also largely from the rhymes, from the lyrics, right? Um, so these are two musical forms chosen for different reasons, uh, similar reasons, but um, uh, one of the differences is that uh, when the jazz tours were taking place, these cities around the world didn't have rich, vibrant, jazz scenes. So jazz, you know, in Karachi was a big deal. Jazz and, you know, jazz arriving in Kinshasa was a big deal. But nowadays these cities have tremendous hip hop scenes, right? Often more political than what's going on in the US, right? 
So uh, many of these hip hop artists don't get very big turnouts, right? So I mean, that's, that's a second point, is that the hip hop diplomacy, they were sending out superstars, Louis Armstrong and Dizzy Gillespie and Duke Ellington. With the hip hop artists, they're sending out, you know, people that many of, many of you haven't heard of, right? Hence the differential impact. I mean, that's one, that's one reason. Jennifer Kanyamibga, a uh, first year student at uh, SIPA. Um, my question is, um, so I'm interning at a, um, a progressive um, NGO called Sankofa, and we just had an event where we invited some of the artists you spoke about, Mortal Technique, Rebel Diaz in the Bronx, and um, Chuck D to come and uh, speak on a panel about hip hop's responsibility in um, finding its voice within um, conversations about being a, being rebellious. So kind of taking the word rebellious and kind of owning it um, instead of letting uh, the media kind of take rebellion into um, a more radical um, kind of evil space. And my question is really with the internet now and with so many um, independent artists um, having an influence, sometimes even bigger influence than the ones that are um, have huge deals, how do you think that um, in this context, talking about hip hop and how it influences young Muslim um, youth, how do you think that uh, they can build coalitions and kind of uh, take back a little bit of the ownership that's been kind of spun around through media? Um, well, look, if you look at the artists that are incredibly popular, the underground artists, so, so to speak, right? Medin in France, um, Immortal Technique, Loki in Britain. Many of, them, many of them exist because of the internet. The internet has amplified their voices and liberated these artists, so the internet is a tool to, you know, to connect and uh, coalition build and so on. And, and Rebel Diaz are doing amazing work. You know, Rebel, Diaz are at the, Rebel Diaz is another NGO, as the gentleman was talking about, NGOs that do diplomatic work. They're based in the Bronx, are they? I'm not yeah, sure, they're still in the in Bronx. The Bronx. Mm -hmm. And you know, they, I remember they staged a performance right in front of the School of the Americas in Georgia, School of the Americas that used to train Latin American leaders. Um, so you know, that's another group that's doing tremendous work and it's the internet that often allows them to connect. Right? So mm -hmm. internet can be used for all kinds of purposes, right? For surveillance and coalition building as well. Yeah. Arsla Javed, I'm a first year student here at SIPA. Um, Hisham, you spoke about this briefly in your book as well. I was wondering if you could elaborate on it. Um, within the Pakistani context, there have been, can you hear me now? Better. Um, there have been a few musicians, Salman Ahmed in particular, who've been these rock musicians who've um, embraced Sufism, but they've gone ahead and politicized it. So they've brought in this negative connotation to something that should be seen more positively. I'm wondering if that is specific to the Pakistani context, or if in your, in your research you saw it in other parts of the world as well. It's definitely not specific, right? Um, so the effort by governments to mobilize Sufism, as I mentioned, often focuses on music. Um, um, Salman Ahmed would become, and some, Salman Ahmed was, again, I showed his, I just showed a, you know, a picture of Salman Ahmed. Uh, he's a guitarist for the group Junoon, a uh, well-known Pakistani rock group. In the 90s, they were, they, were on, they were seen as a protest group challenging the uh, Nawaz Sharif government back then. They got into a bit of trouble. Um, after 9-11, I was gonna play this video, but the sound wasn't very good. Uh, uh, Salman gives a talk at the UN General Assembly saying this is the time for Sufism, this is the time for Rumi. And he, in some ways, he becomes the face of this of this Sufi campaign, right? Um, um, it's an it's an entirely legitimate argument. A number of governments are saying the way to resist what's coming from Arabia, these these ideologies, you know, Salafism and so on, is by stirring up local practice, right? By celebrating folk Islam, Sufi Islam, what exists in our countries. Um, so a number of regimes are doing this, from Senegal to Ethiopia to to Algeria and so on. Um, and s when governments do it, artists are often, you know, are courted to be part of the state-sponsored Sufism. Some artists say yes, other artists say no. And what, you know, what I see is that across the genres, you get artists, Sufi artists affiliated with the government who are saying yes, we need to respond at a discursive level with Sufi discourse as a response to Salafi Wahhabi Takfiri uh, uh, ideology. And then you have others who say, Sure, but not as part of an authoritarian state, not working with an authoritarian state, not part of 
not, not in support of Obama or, or, or Bush policy and so on. So across genres, you begin to get this debate. In France, you have the rapper, French Congolese spoken word artist, um, uh, Abdel Malik, who becomes sort of the face of spoken word poetry, chanson francaise, a former gangster rapper turned Sufi, and his rival, right, is Medine, who's a black powerite, um, and the government is supporting, supporting the Sufi against the black powerite, right? Um, and of course, as soon as you're tapped by the government and you, you become known as a moderate Muslim artist, well, there goes your street cred, right? Um, so artists are, are, are playing, you know, it's, it's a very delicate game, it's a very delicate diplomatic balancing act very often, and these are kids 22, 23 who are having to negotiate, uh, you know, all these, you know, all these different uh, forces. You know, there's a good parallel to this from the mid-2000s with the pro-democracy movements that were going on around the world, and when they got sort of tinged with the Bush administration's globalized, you know, democracy movement, these local legitimate movements were caught in that same dilemma. You know, do you take some of the, yeah, do you take some of the big block grants, you know, from the State Department and USAID, or do you stay local and real and true to the, you know, to your local roots? Um, huge, hugely difficult uh, stuff going on. And just, just one point, um, the gentleman who asked about Latin America uh, left. The, first, the earliest instances of efforts to use hip hop diplomacy are actually in Latin America, right? Uh, there's, there's a wonderful article in, um, in a Spanish journal, the Journal of Anthropology, Revista, it's in, it's in Spanish, about the uses of uh, USAID, you mentioned USAID, USAID attempting to use hip hop in Bolivia to, you know, against uh, left wing rappers, so basically, the Chavez government, Venezuela and Cuba were funding left-wing rappers who were opposed to the privatization of water, and USAID began funding rappers for the privatization of water, right? So it actually begins in, it begins in Latin America. Latin America is often the laboratory uh, for, for, for cultural diplomacy. Um, and you know, there are documents that speak about Latin America as a testing ground for stuff that we can then direct towards other parts of the world. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jesse Bain. I'm a staff person here at SIPA. And I have a question about the debate that you mentioned uh, within American discourse around uh, ideology versus uh, a reaction to policies as the root of anti-Americanism. Do the does the reception of this cultural diplomacy that we've seen so far does it shed some light on this debate one way or the other? I would say yes. Um, if you look at where the cultural diplomacy is having some success. For instance, we spoke of Europe. In some cases, you have perceptions of the U.S. rising and so on. Uh, it tends to be in countries where people are not living under American back tyrannies, right? So with European Muslims, you know, there's a resentment of, of U.S. policy, obviously, whatever that may be, you know, the policies, Palestine, Israel, Palestine, Iraq, and so on. But they're not living under American-backed uh, uh, dictatorships. Um, and so they often see their relationship with the American embassy as a way to leverage concessions and so on from the government. But in other parts of the world, Bahrain is, another, is an example. Um, when you have the diplomatic arm of the state sending out artists to talk about American freedom and so on, while the Pentagon is shipping arms to the Al Thani, to the ruling uh, government so they can crack down on protests, well, people can see the disconnect and often creates, it often creates more ill will, right? Um, and in fact, there's an artist, Chen Lo, uh, who was one of the first to be recruited as a hip hop ambassador, who after the Bahrain case, performing in Bahrain, while the US government is backing the, the tyranny in power, he quit, right? He couldn't do it anymore. He says, you know, like, you know I, was, I, had, I was idealistic, I thought we could make a difference, but it's, it's a very difficult situation to be in, right? Um, you're overseas as a minority defending U.S. policy, while back home there are policies that target the minority and, and so on. Uh, but still, many still argue that it's necessary to do these, these tours. And a strategic naval base, by the way, in Bahrain, yeah, so yeah, policy yeah. gets connected with all of it. Yeah. 